and uh, welcome back. Uh, so we have the, the second lecture about the CMB, please. All right, so welcome, as you heard, to the second lecture on CMB. And so in today's lecture, we'll gain a first understanding of the CMB power spectrum. That's our goal for today. And we will do a first computation of how you go all the way from the initial condition set up in the very beginning of the universe to the way the CMB power spectrum appears in our measurement. Okay, so let me start off by a quick reminder of what we discussed last time, and please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions at, at any time. So last time we discussed what the CMB is, the very basics, you know, how it's clear evidence that the hot Big Bang happened, and we know it happened because we can see its afterglow. Right, so we discussed, first of all, the background CMB illustrated by this extremely unphysical video where you see the CMB emitted from the last scattering surface and traveling through the universe through our telescopes. And then we started to discuss the anisotropies in the microwave background, going beyond just the sort of homogeneous uh, CMB frequency spectrum. And we started to discuss this beautiful image of the CMB temperature and isotropies taken by the Planck satellite. So this is an amazing observation. And if we quantify, if we want to quantify this information that's encoded in the CMB anisotropy map, we can do this nearly fully by computing the CMB power spectrum that you can see here. So again, this is a beautiful measurement. It's amazing for two reasons. First of all, because the precision of these data points is just so high. I mean, experimentally, that's a huge triumph that we've gotten to this point. But it's also an enormous theoretical triumph. And you can see that in this red curve, which shows our best fit lambda CDM model. With just a small number of free parameters, uh, we mentioned that you're able to nearly perfectly fit all of these, uh, you know, many, many, many thousands of degrees of freedom. So we started last time, and we will continue our efforts to try to understand physically the appearance of this CMB power spectrum. Okay, and so there are several features that you would like to understand. Perhaps the most prominent features are the fact that there are these oscillations, right? There is a series of evenly spaced peaks right, in this cosmic microwave background power spectrum, and we'd like to understand where those come from and what sets their scale. We would also like to understand other features of the CMB. For example, why does the power spectrum kind of get cut off and damped away at high L? And then finally, why is there this plateau at low L? So we will discuss all of these features, but in today's lecture, the focus will be trying to understand these peaks that you can see so prominently in the CMB power spectrum. So what is the physics that determines the peaks in the CMB power spectrum? Okay, so there are several things we need to do if we, need to, if we want to understand the CMB power spectrum. First, we need to understand how photons propagate from the last scattering surface to us. Second, we need to understand the initial conditions in lambda CDM. And, and third, we need to understand how those initial conditions evolve in the primordial plasma to give the perturbations on the last scattering surface. So last time we finished that first step, okay? Last time, we computed the propagation of CMB photons from the last scattering surface, the distance chi star away, uh, to us, to our telescopes today. And this allowed us to relate the CMB temperature anisotropies that we observed to the conditions primarily on the last scattering surface. Okay, so this calculation allowed us to understand what it is that we see when we're looking at a map of the cosmic microwave background. So what is it that we're looking at? What do we see when we make a map 
of the C and B temperature and isotropies uh, C dust. Okay, so we discussed this last time. This is just a reminder. There are four terms, and we see the sum of all four of them. First, we see the variations in the radiation density, because these cause the emission of the C and B photons to be uh, delayed or brought to an earlier time. So this is the radiation fractional den density contrast delta R. Then we see the potential at emission on the last scattering surface, which causes red shifting or blue shifting of the C and B photons. Third, we see the, what's called the Doppler term, which reflects the velocity of the last scattering surface. So if the photon is emitted when the, the fluid is, is moving towards us, then we get an increase in the temperature. And finally, we have this very small integrated sachs wolf effect that, effect that reflects the fact that potentials can decay along the photon's path and give photons an additional kick. Right? And just a note here that, in general, these three fields, delta R, phi E, and V, these are all three-dimensional quantities. Okay? So these are full 3D fields. But we are evaluating them on the last scattering surface. So we're assuming instantaneous recombination and decoupling. And so it's, we're just evaluating these terms on a surface located a distance chi star away. So, so chi star in that direction, and hat where I'm looking. And we're evaluating that I'm at a time eta star. OK, so are there any questions about this uh, important expression for what, what it is we're seeing in the CMB? OK, so everyone is either completely clear or very confused. So. Uh, but let's continue. All right, so what we would like to do, we've completed that first step of understanding the propagation and what we're seeing in the CMB. And now let's move on, and what we'd like to do is connect, using this expression, the power spectrum that we see in Planck and other CMB experiments to the initial conditions uh, set in our standard cosmological model by inflation. So we want to connect the power spectrum to the initial conditions. So that's what we'll start off with uh, today. Now, when I'm talking about the initial conditions, I want to start off by reminding you of what inflation predicts. Now, I know that you've had a lecture series on inflation, so you should all be experts in this already. But just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, I'll remind you sort of about just in a few minutes about inflation and, and what it predicts. OK, so inflation, of course, was a, a mechanism that was originally thought of to explain problems in the background cosmology. The flatness problem, for example, and the horizon problem. But soon after, it was realized that inflation also provides a beautiful mechanism for explaining where all the structure in the universe comes from, and a beautiful mechanism for producing the sort of the small density fluctuations or the small perturbations, which are the seeds from which all the fluctuations in the universe grew. Okay, so the picture here is, and I'm sure you've discussed this in a lot of detail, and we'll also go over this again later is that you have a phase of you know, extremely rapid accelerated expansion in the very beginning of the universe. And this doesn't just blow the universe up, but if you treat the in inflaton field quantum mechanically, then you see that these small quantum fluctuations in the inflaton field value that normally you wouldn't see suddenly get blown up and become real uh, curvature fluctuations. They become real curvature and density fluctuations uh, that then provide uh, the seeds from which all of the structures that we see in the universe uh, around us today can grow. For example, the, you know, all the galaxies and the, the stars and the planets and people 
in our standard cosmology are taken to have grown from these quantum fluctuations set by inflation. Now, what's nice about the CMB is that we can see these density fluctuations almost at the beginning. Okay, so we can see these tiny seeds from which all structure grows, at least on larger scales, uh, you know, very close to uh, the beginning of the universe. Okay, so this, I think, is an amazing idea, and uh, hopefully everyone appreciates just how cool this is, that in our standard cosmology, you know, stars and planets and uh, people exist because there was a quantum fluctuation in the inflaton field value in the early universe, so that's sort of amazing. Um, and, you know, all the structure comes from that, including this cool image from the James Webb Taste Space Telescope that hopefully you've all seen. Um, so all the structure comes from inflationary uh, quantum fluctuations, we believe. For now, though, for the purposes of this course, I'm not going to keep dwelling on the fact that this is a really cool idea, but I will just tell you the answer for what inflation predicts, and we'll use it to compute the CMB power spectrum. So for now, you can take these as just assumptions. Apparently, I am, uh, my voice is too low, so can my microphone be adjusted? Um, maybe this is better? Okay, all right, I guess it's okay. All right, so as you've seen in other courses, uh, hopefully you know lots of details about this already, and I'll re review some of this later. The key point is that you can predict the properties of one very useful and important variable, the co-moving curvature perturbation R. Okay? Now, this quantity has some really nice properties. In particular, outside the horizon, this quantity is constant and it's conserved. Okay, and that's really useful because at some early stages of the universe, we might not know the physics very well, but this quantity is conserved, and this provides the initial conditions for the subsequent growth of structure. Okay, so if you want to get some intuition, you can roughly think of this as the potential perturbation initial condition, although it's related by a, a constant factor to the co-moving curvature perturbation that depends on the background equation of state. Okay, but so you can just think of it intuitively as uh, basically the potential perturbation initial condition. So this is the initial condition for the subsequent growth of structure and for the evolution of the cosmic microwave background. Now, what does inflation tell us about the properties of this co-moving curvature perturbation? All right, so the key point is that sort of standard inflationary models tell us that the curvature perturbation is well described by a power spectrum, PR, that is nearly scale invariant. And what I mean by that is that k cubed times this power spectrum is approximately constant in scale. So there's a very, you know, th this expression is nearly scale independent. Okay? So th these are the initial conditions that I'm just going to assume are set by inflation. It generates a curvature perturbation power spectrum that's nearly scale invariant, so this expression is close to constant. Now we have discussed the initial conditions, we would like to understand how these evolve to, for example, form the CMB, and I'm sure in other courses you've discussed how these turn into large-scale structure. Now the CMB has particularly nice properties if you want to compute the evolution of the initial conditions into what you observe. And what's particularly nice about the CMB is that all of these perturbations are really small when you evaluate them in the CMB. These perturbations, delta R, phi E, et cetera, are you know, a part in 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. So these are tiny perturbations. Unlike today, if you look in the universe, you know, we are order 
one perturbation. We are very large perturbations, and so our planet is hard to describe with a simple perturbation theory. But these perturbations are so small that linear perturbation theory is an excellent approximation. Okay, so we can compute the evolution from the initial conditions to uh, these radiation density contrasts and potentials, et cetera, very well using just linear evolution, linear perturbation theory. And what that means is that each Fourier mode K evolves independently. Okay, so they don't mix. And I can relate all of these quantities, delta R, phi E, to the initial conditions because all Fourier modes K evolve independently very simply with just a linear sort of transfer function T of K. Okay, so for example, if I want to know the radiation <coughs> fractional density contrast delta R, I can just Fourier transform that. And that radiation density contrast delta R of K at a time eta is related to the initial curvature perturbation of the same knit wave number with just a simple transfer function T of K eta. Okay? So the entire evolution problem just comes down to computing these transfer functions. All right, does that make sense? All right. Now, yesterday I was asked what are the most relevant terms in this expression for the C and B temperature anisotropies? What are the biggest and the most important terms? Um, and what I said is basically the first two terms dominate on many scales, although the third term is also pretty important. So the first two terms are the most important ones, delta R over 4 and uh, phi E. And because those are arguably the, the most, the biggest terms, let's just focus on those for now. And then in the next lectures, we'll discuss the velocity uh, and ISW term. Okay, in fact, for convenience, sometimes to avoid always writing delta R over 4 plus phi, I'm just going to call the sum of those two terms S, the sachs wolf term. Okay, so S, it's just that sum delta R over 4 plus phi E. But again, this is a three-dimensional quantity, S of uh, co-moving position X and conformal time eta. And therefore, I can just define a transfer function for S, which is the sum of the transfer functions for these two variables. So the Fourier trace space transfer function for the sachs wolf term, S of k eta, is just given by the initial conditions, well, sorry, relates the initial conditions in terms of this co-moving curvature perturbation uh, to the final sachs wolf term. Okay, so S is T times R. And again, this curvature perturbation is set by inflation. That describes the initial conditions. And this transfer function encodes all of the, the physics in the primordial plasma that takes us from the initial conditions to, to the CMB observables, to the perturbations that are relevant here. Right, to the sachs wolf terms. Okay, so if you want to get some intuition, effectively, and that you, I think I've heard the analogy that you can imagine the surface of a lake. And if I drop a rock in, that's sort of the, the starting point. That's like the initial condition in terms of this curvature perturbation. And what this transfer function does is it computes sort of the response of the lake to that sort of initial condition that I'm, I'm dropping a rock in. So I can see that waves propagate, and I can see ripples, and all of this causal plasma physics is encoded by this transfer function uh, for the Sachs-Wolf term. Yeah? Like, there is a 
There's a question from the chat. Uh, can you explain again uh, the physical meaning of the R? Yeah, so I'm not going to discuss this in a huge amount of detail because I assume that will be discussed in your, you know, much more rigorously in your inflation course or already has been. Uh, if, for practical purposes in the CMB course, you can just think of it as the sort of potential initial condition. Okay, but it, it really reflects the, the sort of curvature or perturbation uh, early on set by inflation. Okay. Um, yeah, so, but again, I, I think, have they already had an inflation course? Okay, so, so rather than me trying to de define this extremely rigorously beyond saying just think of it as the initial potential perturbation con initial condition, I recommend that you look at your inflation lecture notes, which should, which should have this discussed in a lot more detail. Okay, so we have a transfer, we need to compute this transfer function, Ts, that takes us from the initial conditions to the Sachs-Wolf term that we observed today, and that's what we'll be doing later. But for now, I want to go one step further. So I know now how to relate the initial conditions to the anisotropy map, but what I want to do is know how the initial conditions relate to the CMB power spectrum. Okay. So I need to now go from describing a map to describing a power spectrum. So let's do that. All right, and so there's a little bit of mathematics here that you'll uh, potentially want to go through. So again, the question is how do I get a power spectrum if I know the field? All right, so there's a, the, the basic concept is fairly straightforward, but we now want to evaluate this Sachs-Wolf term on this last scattering surface, okay? So we know that the temperature anisotropy is set by the Sachs-Wolf term on the last scattering surface. So in other words, it's set by the Sachs-Wolf term evaluated at a position x equals n hat chi, where chi is the distance to the CMB, and at a time eta star, where eta star is when CMB photons are emitted. Okay, does that make sense? I'm just choosing the position of that last scattering surface, a shell around me. Now, if I want to get to the power spectrum, it's convenient to describe this three-dimensional field, S of X, using an inverse Fourier transform. So I'll write this in terms of Fourier modes. And you know how to do this. I just write this in terms of e to the i k dot x times the Fourier uh, transform of the Sachs-Wolf term. And this is the expression that I get, noting that x is just n hat chi. One quick note here is that this is a Fourier transform on an equal time slice, okay? So I've just assumed that time is e to star, and I've done a Fourier transform on that spatial slice. All right, now I want to figure out what pa the power spectrum of theta is. And there's a nice trick you can use to figure out the spherical multiple coefficients, which I need to evaluate an angular power spectrum. And that trick is to use this sort of Rayleigh plane wave identity, which relates e to the i kx to a sum over spherical harmonics. All right, so I've reproduced that identity here on the top. E to the i k x is a sum over spherical harmonics uh, with Bessel functions, J L of k x, in that sum as well. So all I'm going to do is plug in that Rayleigh plane wave identity into I, e to the i k x. Then I get a sum over Bessel functions and spherical harmonics. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to replace S of k with the transfer function times the initial condition, the, the primordial curvature uh, perturbation. Okay? 
So those are the only two things I've done, even though this expression looks very complicated. And now I would like to read off the spherical multiple coefficient ALM, basically the spherical harmonic transform of theta, because that's what I need to get to the power spectrum. So if I know that this expression holds, basically my work is done, because I know that if I have a sum over LM multiplying spherical harmonics, whatever the prefactor is to the spherical harmonic, that's the spherical multiple coefficient. Okay, so effectively everything in front of YLM is ALM in this sum over LM. And you can also just see that by orthogonality. You could multiply by uh, Y star LM, do an integral, uh, but this is basically what you'd find. So just looking at the prefactor of this YLM, I can read off the spherical multiple coefficient ALM, and this is what you get. Okay, so we have now done a spherical harmonic transform of the CMB temperature anisotropies, and we've written them in terms of the initial conditions, Bessel functions, and a transfer function. Now we'd like to get the power spectrum, though, and I will have you do that as an exercise. So what you need to do now is take these spherical multiple coefficients and just compute the power spectrum, the average of ALM, A star LM. Okay, so that's a small exercise, and you can use this definition of the curvature perturbation power spectrum. So with a little bit of work, you should find an expression relating the power spectrum to the initial conditions, which is what we wanted in the beginning of this lecture. And this is the, the expression that you will find. Okay, so what you see here is that the power spectrum, CL, depends, first of all, on the initial conditions on the primordial power spectrum, PR. Second, it depends on the evolution of these initial conditions in the plasma through this transfer function that takes you from the initial conditions to the properties of the perturbations when the CMB is emitted, TS. And finally, it depends on this Bessel function and it integrated over K. Now the Physically, what this Bessel function in integral over k is doing is it's projecting, okay? So these k modes are defined, these wave numbers are all defined in 3D, but what we're looking at is a 2D surface intersecting these three-dimensional wave numbers. Okay, so the function of this Bessel function is really to project from 3D k to 2D l, or from, you know, wave number to angular multiple. Okay, so let's go into some more detail. Are there any questions about this expression, by the way? Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah? Uh, sorry, what is uh, superscript like what? That's right, the superscript is added to CL yeah. on your block. What, what does the superscript like that mean? You mean to TT, for example. Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. So in the first few lectures, we will only talk about the power spectrum of CMB temperature anisotropies, okay? The power spectrum of that temperature map. But in... One of our later lectures, we will note that the CMB is polarized. And so there's not just one field that we can observe in the CMB. There's not just the CMB temperature map, but there's also polarization maps. And so you can measure power spectra of those fields also, and those will have a different superscript. So for now, that's not relevant, but there are other power spectra that I can observe. Okay. Good. So this is our expression for relating the CMB power spectrum to the initial conditions via the transfer function. Let's give a few more details about this projection via the Bessel function. So 
what you can do is you can just plot a few of these special functions for different L's. Okay, so here's L equals 10 and L equals 30. And you'll note that these special functions always have a, have a peak. Okay? And this peak is located at a value when k chi star is approximately equal to L. Okay? So the projection involves an integral over some function, but that function has a, a pretty strong peak when k chi star is equal to L. So you could just say, accept that as mathematics, but there's some nice intuition there for why that is the most dominant form of projection. Mainly, k projects to L over chi. Right, and intuition is the following one. Remember what we've done is that we've considered three-dimensional k-modes. So here I'm sort of showing the crests of a certain uh, mode k. So this is, has a certain wavelength uh, given by this relation. And I'm looking at how that, that plane wave intersects with the spherical last scattering surface. Okay, so here in pink, I'm showing the last scattering surface. All right, so here's my 3D wave described by a 3D wave number k, and I'm looking at sort of the intersection of that wave with this last scattering surface. Now, why do I get a projection that mainly maps k chi to L? Well, let's see if we can just get this intuitively. What would you expect? Right? What you would expect is that if I have a wavelength lambda, the angle that that shows up in is you know, generally given by the small angle approximation. So theta times chi is lambda. Okay? So this is chi. So chi times theta should be lambda. That's going to be the main angle that this wavelength projects to. Of, of course, that's not true everywhere. You know, if you, if you see, so here it certainly should be true that chi theta is lambda, but you know, if you look further away, the intersection, uh, the angles can vary a little bit. But generally, something like this expression should be approximately correct. Okay, so if we just assume this small angle approximation that we've argued should be physically true, that uh, lambda is chi theta, and we note that k is 2 pi over lambda and l is 2 pi over theta, these, we have these sort of Fourier inverse relations, then we find that this Bessel function projection statement, k chi is l, is just saying the same thing as our physical intuition has led us to, to believe. Okay, so this is just a restatement that mainly a wavelength lambda projects to an angle lambda over chi. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, the intuition for this projection via the Bessel function? Does that make sense? Okay. So it's not, it's not a perfect relation, but mainly this wavelength projects to that angle. All right. So, sorry, this is the expression we had, this is the projection, and we've argued that there's a strong peak at a certain k, when k chi is L. Now, we can get a pretty good approximation to the result of this integral by saying that if this function is so peaked, we'll get roughly the same answer if we just replace these two factors by a constant evaluated at the peak. Okay, so this is varying a lot faster than this, and it has a strong peak, so you get roughly the right answer if you just evaluate these two factors at the peak, pull them out of the integral, and just do the integral over the Bessel function. So that's a pretty good approximation 
at least on small angular scales. Okay, so that's what I'll do. I'll replace these two factors by a k corresponding to the peak of the Bessel function, pull them out of the integral, do the integral, and what I get is this. An even simpler expression relating the CMB power spectrum to the initial conditions. All right, so here I have, again, the CMB power spectrum on the left, and it depends on three things, just as it did before. It depends on the initial conditions. It depends on what happens to those initial conditions in the plasma, and then it depends through the transfer function, and then it depends on projection, where the projection is really simple. It's just k is L over chi. Okay? Now, what's nice about that is it kind of illustrates that all the structure that you see in the CMB has to, you know, can't be primordial because we've argued that from inflation, you know, this is a, at least in our standard model, we've argued that from inflation, this quantity here, k cubed p, is scale invariant. So this is just constant in k, and it's therefore constant in L to a really good approximation. Okay, so the power spectrum, and we usually plot this combination L, L plus 1, CL. If there were no, if the transfer function were just one, it would just be flat. You would just be seeing the initial conditions, and those would be flat. But the plasma does lots of interesting things. There's lots of cool physics, and so it has a lot of structure. Okay, and it's because of this plasma processing, because of this interesting physics encoded in the transfer function, that the CMB has the peaks that it does. Not because of the initial conditions, which just set a flat line. So we've now related the CMB power spectrum to the initial conditions, and we figured out that what we need to do is compute this transfer function. And then we've understood everything. So the big question is, what is the plasma processing? What is the evolution of the initial conditions in the plasma that produces the perturbations that we evaluate at last scattering and that is so important for setting the power spectrum. So that's what we'll discuss now. Are there any questions about everything so far? All right. Can you one more time repeat why we can use this approximation that chi equals L divided by chi? Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's sort of just a mathematical result, was that? Oh, sorry, yeah. So why can I use this approximation that L is k chi, well, effectively, it's just from looking at the Bessel functions and noting that they're very strongly peaked uh, at uh, k chi corresponding to that relation. Okay, so uh, we can make approximations based on that. And they agree very fairly well, at least on small scales, with the full numerical calculation, which you can also do. All right, so let's move on and try to figure out the plasma processing, the acoustic processing. So again, our goal is to derive this transfer function Ts, taking us from the initial conditions, the initial condition power spectrum, to the final CMB observables. Now, what is the physics that we need to understand here? It's mainly set by the interplay of two things, of gravity and radiation pressure. There are other effects as well, but the, the, the zeroth order, you have to think about gravity and you have to think about radiation pressure as sort of a restoring force. Now remember, what we want to calculate is the sachs wolf term, so we need to understand what happens to delta R and phi. Okay, how do we do this? Well, we need to understand how these quantities, delta R and phi, evolve. Okay? Now, as usual, the tools we have are we writing down conservation of stress energy and the Einstein equation. Can I? Yeah. So there is a question from uh, Zoom. Uh, how do the Bessel functions make their way into the integrand? Um, that is, 
encoded in a few slides that we talked about where we did this projection explicitly, and I, I asked you to look at that as an exercise, so hopefully you'll understand that uh, better then. They came in via this Rayleigh plane wave expansion. There are also other ways of doing that, but that's where they first appeared. And they, they just come about from projecting um, 3D Ks to 2D Ls. Okay, so we'd like to see how delta R and phi evolve. How will we do this? Well, we will do perturbation theory for a, a, a fluid. Now, the fact that I'm saying I have a radiation fluid is an approximation that is not true on all scales that are relevant here. And so it'll break down when we're looking at very small scales, when we approach the sort of mean free path of, of the scattering of a C and B photon in this primordial plasma. But for now, we'll consider scales much larger than the mean free path. We can assume I have a, a sort of perfect radiation fluid. So what I'll do is I will take the stress energy tensor, I will perturb it, I will assume that I have perturbations in rho, p, and u, and I will also, as we did before, allow for the metric, the FLRW metric, to be perturbed with Newtonian potential perturbations phi. Okay, to derive equations of motion and evolution equations, there are two things I can do. I could look at the conservation of stress energy, and I could look at the Einstein equations. Those are the two tools I have in relativistic perturbation theory and GR perturbation theory. I actually only need the first one. All I need to do is perturb this stress energy tensor and invoke conservation of this stress energy tensor. So, you know, T mu nu semicolon nu is zero. And I will get two important conservation equations that will give us a lot of the physics of the CMB. The first one that comes out of conserving stress energy is the continuity equation. It's the zero component of conserving stress energy. And it just tells you that energy is, it tells you about energy conservation. Okay, that's the sort of classical interpretation here. And it's given in terms of the pressures and energy density perturbations of the component I'm considering. Now here I'm going to be considering, of course, radiation fluid, so we'll make this simpler in a second, but this is the general equation for the evolution of any you know, fluid component in terms of pressures and energy densities and uh, potentials as well. Now I can also look at the spatial part of the conservation of stress energy. And that gives me the Euler equation, which reflects momentum conservation. Okay, and that Euler equation, in terms of the velocity of this photon fluid, is written down here. Again, in terms of energy density and pressure of the relevant radiation fluid component. So since we're talking about radiation, we know pressure is rho over 3, right? W is 1 third. Okay, so these are the basic equations that I start from. Are there any questions about that? I've conserved the stress energy tensor, and I've gotten an equation for energy conservation and momentum conservation. Okay, so hopefully you've seen this also in, for example, your large-scale structure course. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to specialize here to radiation, set rho, P is rho over 3, and then it gets a lot simpler. I will just note as a quick aside that there's another form you can use that rewrites the Euler equation in terms of momentum density. We'll come back to that, though. Okay, so let's plug in P is rho over 3, and I get two basic equations that will allow me to figure out the evolution of this radiation fluid. The first one is the simplified continuity equation. For the radiation fractional density contrast. And the second one is the Euler equation. Now I can combine those, and I'm sure you can see how, to form one nice differential equation for 
delta r in terms of phi. So how, how do I get a differential equation for delta r? What do I have to do? What's that? Yeah, I could take the divergence of, of v and plug in. I'm just going to take the derivative of that. Yeah, so I'm going to take the time derivative of that top equation and plug in the divergence of that second equation. Okay, so just walking you through this. Take the time derivative of the continuity equation, plug in the divergence of the Euler equation, simplify, and I get this expression, which is already uh, turning into a, an interesting looking equation. And if I go to Fourier space and I Fourier transform, these nabla squares turn into k squares, or rather minus k squares, and I get a really nice and simple equation. Okay, so just to recap, I combine continuity and Euler equations for a radiation fluid, and what I get is an equation that looks like that. Now this is almost looking like a harmonic oscillator equation. Okay, so continuity, Euler equation for radiation fluid, do some, do some algebra, and this is what I get. Okay, and so you can see there's a nice physical interpretation here that the evolution of the radiation density contrast is driven by the interplay of two things. First of all, on the right, I have a sort of gravitational driving force from the potential, but opposing that, I have radiation pressure, which is you know, like a spring providing a restoring force. Okay? Are there any questions about that? Uh, yeah? What was that? Uh, sorry, which, so on the right-hand side, I have a gravitational driving force. That's my interpretation from the potential. So that's this one. And then this term with the k squared provides the sort of the radiation pressure uh, term. Okay. Now, if we're considering large scales, we can assume that the modes are evolving during matter domination and then the potentials are constant, and I can rearrange to an even nicer, even simpler form that you could have solved many, many years ago, which is this one. Okay, so this is the starting point for understanding the CMB power spectrum. Okay, so it's a simple harmonic oscillator for, fortunately, exactly the combination that we care about. Delta R over 4 plus phi. This is exactly that Sachs-Wolf term. Okay, so this is the equation governing delta R over 4 plus phi. And what you see is it's a simple harmonic oscillator equation for each wave number k. So if you're wondering why I get oscillatory features, I have a simple harmonic oscillator equation, and we'll connect those two shortly. Okay, so this system supports oscillations known as acoustic oscillations in the plasma. Okay, now what is the frequency of these oscillations? Well, it's just k over root 3. And so what I know is that the higher the k, the faster this perturbation oscillates. Okay? So if I have Twice the k, I'll have twice as fast an oscillation. All right, are there any questions about this pretty basic equation that is so important for understanding the CMB? Uh, yeah? Why are you uh, what was that? Why, sorry, why are we considering mass dominated era if we are going from inflation to zero? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I'll talk about that in more detail, but basically what we're... Oh, sorry. 
yeah, the question was, why are we considering just the matter-dominated era where I can assume phi is constant when we're going all the way from inflation uh, through to today, right? Through the irradiation era. And, and the answer is that we're considering, this is a good approximation on large scales where either the modes were during matter domination or they were outside the horizon where nothing happened, where I can just assume there's no evolution and I just have this initial condition R. Okay, so, but we'll come back to these details shortly. All right, so I know the solution to this, right? And I'll write that down shortly just to give you a little bit more intuition. Again, you can imagine the system just like a, a sort of two balls connected by a spring that are in a well, all right? So this is the potential well. It's providing gravitational force. But then I also have a restoring force due to photon pressure. So it's a harmonic oscillator forced by a potential that's constant. And if you want to consider a certain wave number, then this is maybe the picture you should have. Okay, so I have a constant potential providing gravitational force. And this gives me a standing wave where the restoring force is provided by the radiation pressure. That's the equivalent of the spring in this picture. Okay, so each 3D wave number will sort of oscillate up and down like a standing wave. And the higher the K, the faster it'll oscillate. Okay, now let's solve this and understand the CMB power spectrum peaks. Okay, so this is the equation for the evolution of the sachs wolf term. It's a simple harmonic oscillator. We know the solutions. They're cosines, cos k eta over root three, and sines, okay? Now I can use a convenient trick and just rewrite eta over root three as rs, just assuming that the speed of sound is one over root three. That's mathematically identical, and that's known as the sound horizon, just eta over root three in our case, but later on the speed of sound will be different and this expression will still hold. Okay, so this is the solution, k eta over root three. That's how it evolves. Now, we have cosine options as a solution and we have sine options as a solution. Does anyone know which one is produced in the universe and why? So I have an oscillator, I have cosines and sines I can use to produce a solution. Which one should I use? Any idea? Uh, yeah? Okay, it's even. Any other reason why you might want to use a cosine? Yeah? Yeah, it's non zero at zero. And not only is it non zero at zero, but it's sort of constant. There's no velocity. So everything starts off with this sort of constant zero velocity initial, initial condition. And that's exactly what's produced by inflation and that's what we need to match onto. So there's no initial evolution, no initial velocity produced by inflation in our initial condition. And so we only need to match onto the cosine term. We only need to use the, we only can use the cosine term from inflation, yeah? Okay, so we conclude that we start off with an initial condition R at time zero, and this evolves with a transfer function that's cos k rs, or like, cos k e to over root three. There is a question from uh, Zuma. Yeah. Shouldn't there be a friction term uh, in uh, the harmonic oscillator equation since the amplitude would potentially damp? Uh, yes, and we will talk about that later. Now we're, so the, yeah, so now we're just doing a first approximation and later on we'll add successive layers of detail like damping. Okay, so that's it. That's to first approximation. This is our transfer function. It's cos k eta over root three or cos krs. Can you repeat that again for the cosine? The argument for why I should just be using a cosine? Yeah, so, so basically, If I have inflation, 
I produce an initial condition that sort of just has a, the initial condition just has a constant value and no sort of velocity, right? It just, it's just frozen. There's, it, there's no evolution outside the horizon. The initial condition is just that I have one value for the curvature perturbation. Okay, I don't have an initial condition where there's lots of dynamics and things are evolving. I have, I have to match on to something with a certain non-zero value and with zero uh, time derivative. And that is only accomplished by a cosine. Okay, so we have the solution. We know the transfer function, the Sachs-Wolf transfer function is given by a cos KRS. It's given by a cosine. And now we know the power spectrum in this simple approximation. Since we've already written down that the CLs are just given by the primordial power, which is just flat, uninteresting, times this transfer function squared, that would predict a power spectrum that has replacing k as L over chi star oscillations that are proportional to cos squared L. So that explains the basic physics, although not the details, which we'll get to shortly, of why I have cosines, an oscillation that looks like cos squared L. And that is the basic physics of why I see a series of oscillatory peaks and troughs in multiple L. And that's what we see in the CMB. Now there's a lot of details that we're going to add now, but that's the basic physics. Right? I have a radiation fluid that's producing acoustic oscillations with the interplay of gravity and pressure. And the transfer function is a cosine. That leads me to cos squared oscillations in CL. Okay, so that's the very basics of why the CMB looks the way it does. Let's explain this in a little bit more detail. So we said that the transfer function, the evolution, is given by cos k eta over root 3, or cos krs. So I have oscillatory solutions, and the, the frequency of oscillation is different for each wave number. Okay, so if you pay attention, please, if you've zoned out, because this is important for understanding how the CMB works. The oscillation frequency depends on the wave number. Okay, and the higher the k is, the higher the oscillation frequency is. Now, at recombination and decoupling, at a fixed time, certain frequencies have reached a maximum of their oscillation. Okay? So certain k, therefore, are at a maximum of their oscillation. For example, this k, this wavelength, has just undergone one half period of oscillation. And it's therefore reached a sort of maximum or minimum of its oscillation at a time when the CMB is released. And this wave number k corresponds to the first peak. The first peak reflects a wave number, reflects scales that have just undergone one compression. Okay, now a question for you. What does the second peak reflect? Yeah? So, well, it has to again be at an extreme of its excursion. So it has to be oscillating basically twice as fast. In other words, it has to have twice the wave number. So this is the wave number responsible for the second peak. Okay? And that, again, has a wave number twice times the fundamental, and again has just reached a maximum of its oscillation when the CMB is emitted. And so I have, at the time when the CMB is emitted, there are certain frequencies, certain multiples of this first peak wave number that are all reaching a maximum of their oscillation at the same time. So there are certain k and certain l 
which are reaching the maximum of their oscillation when the CMB is emitted. And that's what you're seeing as the series of peaks in the CMB power spectrum. Did that make sense? Are there any questions about this basic picture? Yep? Yeah? What does B stand for? What's that? What does B stand for? Yeah, that's a good question. So what is B? It's sort of a minimum. Well, B corresponds to a frequency that's you know, just undergone sort of three quarters of a period, right? So it's, it's sort of oscillated down. And then it's just come back up and reached zero. OK, does that make sense? So peaks correspond to wave numbers that have just reached a maximum or a minimum of their oscillation. And troughs correspond to wave numbers or frequencies that have just reached a zero point in their oscillation. All right? Now, there's an interesting point here, which is that this series of peaks provides really nice evidence that something like inflation has to have happened. Okay? And for a long time, there was a debate of what set the initial conditions for structure formation. Okay? And so let me just ask you a question, which is, imagine I set the initial conditions that were not like in inflationary initial conditions, where everything is produced with zero velocity right at the beginning. But instead, I kind of start randomly uh, producing perturbations at a range of different times, or I produce perturbations that have a velocity. So I've tried to sketch this with really terrible uh, diagrams here. So please forgive me just drawing on the slide. Would you, get a C, would you get peaks in the CMB power spectrum that look like this? If you produce perturbations not right at the beginning, but continuously, or you produce them with a velocity, would you get the same series of peaks? Right, you wouldn't, right? Because they're not, the only way you get the series in peaks is if you set off everything in phase early on with zero velocity. If you generate oscillations with many different phases, with sines and cosine contributions, they'll tend to kind of average out, and you'll get a spectrum that's much smoother. OK, so the fact that I see these nice oscillations means that the initial conditions were set very early on, and everything was released in phase. Everything started off right at the beginning. And so that's a pretty powerful statement. Excuse me, and why the amplitude also depends on k? Uh, why does the amplitude of... Also depends on, on k, on the, on the wave, wave... Oh, you mean here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that now. So this is just the zeroth order explanation, and then we'll keep iterating, and you'll get a better and better understanding. Okay. Um, that is exactly the question I was going to ask, which is, you know, why are the peaks not all the same size? Why do I have the first peak being really big, and the second peak being a little smaller, and the third peak being bigger again? So why are there different sizes in the peaks? And that's the last thing I want to explain today. All right, so we've explained why it looks like cost squared L over chi, so why I have cosine oscillations in L, but why are the odd peaks larger? Okay, so there's some details here. I won't have a ton of time, so I'll um, maybe just give you a slightly less quantitative picture. But the basic effect that we've neglected and that will cause the differences in the heights of the peaks is the fact that I don't just have a photon fluid, but instead I have a fluid with photons, electrons, and protons, or photons and baryons. And what do these baryons, i.e. protons and electrons, do? Well. For this oscillator, they don't do very much, but what they do is they add a bunch of momentum. They, you know, they have mass, and they increase the momentum of this fluid. So it's called a sort of photon-baryon fluid. Now has sort of more inertia, and that slightly changes the dynamics. Okay. So the way I can do this quantitatively is the Euler equation can be written in terms of this momentum density Q, 
which is just rho plus p times v summed over all the components in this fluid. And it used to be that we just had rho r plus p r times v r. We just had radiation. But now I'm going to add to that a contribution from the baryons. And so all of these baryons will do is they will contribute rho b v b. And I'm assuming what's called tight coupling. In other words, that the velocities of the baryons and the photons are the same. And if that's true, all that happens is that the baryons just increase this momentum density. So they just boost the momentum density by a factor 1 plus r. OK? And otherwise, the equations are the same. So the Euler equation gets modified by an increased momentum density due to the baryons being very heavy. The energy conservation for the photons doesn't change because the scattering does not change the energy uh, for a Thomson scattering. Okay, now I can again work through the relevant equations. I again have the uh, continuity equation, the Euler equation, and I combine them and I get a differential equation for how the radiation perturbation evolves, or more accurately, the radiation and baryon uh, perturbation. It's just a more complicated equation now, but the, the basic physics is the same. Again, the evolution of the radiation density contrast is set by the interplay of gravitational forces and radiation pressure, which provides a restoring force and leads to an oscillation. I also have additional terms, for example, this interesting term, which is a damping term. And uh, the physics here is that as the universe expands, the velocities of the baryons end up decreasing. Okay, so the velocities redshift, and that affects the dynamics. All right, but again, I have an oscillator equation just with some additional complications and additional terms uh, due to the fact that I'm now not neglecting the baryons, and I'm not just assuming it's a pure radiation fluid. Now I'm having these baryons move along with the photon fluid. What is the solution? I'm just going to sort of write down the solution, um, but I will have to give you sort of a little bit of detail that I'm not going to derive. Hopefully you'll discuss this in your large scale structure course, and it's what the potential is doing. OK, so we need to differentiate large scales where the modes evolve mainly during matter domination and where the potential can be approximated as constant and small scales where the potential effectively has decayed away. So again, let's start by thinking about large scales, evolution during matter domination. That was the case we talked about earlier. OK, so again, we have this a modification of what we talked about earlier with these additional terms. And the question is, what happens to the solution? Previously, we had a nice pure cosine of solution. Now we've added baryons. The differential equation changes. What happens to the dynamics? What happens to the solution? Well, again, the solution is cosines and sines. But you now have this additional term. There's, a, there's sort of an offset that gets introduced by the fact that I've included the baryons. And you, if you rearrange, assuming that phi is constant and matching initial conditions, you obtain for the sachs wolf term not that it's just a pure cosine, but it's now a cosine minus 3r. So it's a, it's a cosine with a constant offset. OK? So again, I've, I used to just think about a pure photon fluid, and then I got cosine oscillations of the radiation density and, and the sachs wolf term. Now I include baryons. It changes the differential equation. The upshot is the sachs wolf term just gets a constant offset. It's no longer a cosine, but it's co cos kr minus 3r. So instead of having pure cosine oscillations with time, I now shift these downwards, this minus 3r part, 
shifts the solution down and whereas I used to have a symmetry between the odd peaks, which are compressions, sort of half periods, and the even peaks, now that symmetry is broken, right? So I have a different amplitude here than here. Okay, and this offset leads um, to the different heights of the peaks. So I'm not going to consider the radiation dominated solution, I'll just write down the answer. That one is still pure cosine, it's not very affected by the baryons because radiation density is so dominant during the radiation era, I can just neglect the baryons. And so the summary of a more detailed treatment is that at, on large scales at low K, where the baryons are important during matter domination, I don't have a pure cosine, I have an offset. Whereas at high K, it's still just a pure cosine. And that's the result for our more detailed calculation, okay, from when we include the baryons. It's not a pure cosine, it's offset on large scales. And that explains why the odd and even peaks have a different amplitude. Because I'm shifting that cosine, um, the baryons cause an asymmetry between the compression and rarefaction peaks between the odd and even peaks. Okay, so we've now determined this transfer function in a more detailed scenario, and it's given by uh, these expressions without r. All right, it's just cos minus 3r or cos. And again, the dynamics though is the same, right? When we're looking at a fixed time, certain, certain wavelengths or certain frequencies are at a maximum of their oscillation, and those are the scales, the multiples that we see as peaks in the CMB. Okay, so modes with KRS is n pi, or L over chi RS is n pi, those modes have just reached a maximum of their oscillation. And that's what you see as the series of peaks in the CMB. Okay, so now we're getting closer to explaining the full shape of this power spectrum, the full shape at least of this red sachs wolf contribution. We've explained why there's a series of cosine oscillations. We've explained why the first peak is bigger than the second peak and the third peak is big again. It's because baryons increase the odd peaks, which are compressional peaks, and decrease the rarefaction peaks. So we've explained this general shape and it's a reasonable first approximation. But we're still not done. We still need to explain lots of features about this power spectrum. We need to, for example, explain why it gets cut off at high L. Why does the amplitude decay? We also have not yet explained what's going on at low L. Why is there this plateau? So next time, we will further advance our refinement of why the CMB power spectrum looks the way it does. Right? And we'll add more details to the computation of the transfer function. But I hope from this lecture you've at least taken away why there are oscillatory peaks in the CMB. It would be a constant if you just looked at the initial conditions, but the transfer function reflects the dynamics of the photon baryon plasma. I have a harmonic oscillator where gravity drives the oscillation, but photon pressure provides a restoring force. And when I look at the time of CMB emission, certain scales have reached a maximum of their oscillation. And that's why I see this series of acoustic peaks in the CMB. Okay, so more details next time, but that's the basic physics. Thank you. I take a question from, uh, from the chat uh, by Patrick. Uh, can you clarify again how inflationary initial conditions imply peaks uh, of the CMB? From the formula for the CL, it looks like the fluctuation of the CMB is due to the transfer function rather than uh, the power spectrum, uh, which is calculated uh, from inflation. Right. Um, so 
it's the fact that that transfer function you know, always starts from an initial time with a pure cosine oscillation. If every different mode had a different transfer function that was, had a mix of sines and cosines, then I would get this sort of jumble of different phases when I'm evaluating the CMB. And I wouldn't see this nice series of peaks. So it's the fact that inflation sets the starting point, sets the initial condition, and that all fluctuations are released in the same phase with a pure cosine oscillation that's characteristic of the inflationary initial conditions. You know, you can imagine that, um, you know, for example, if I have textures or some late time causal mechanism, those would continuously generate perturbations and the transfer function would not be a pure cosine, right? I would have some contributions uh, in, with different phases, some produced later on, and so I'd have a sort of mix of cosines and sines on average, and you know, each mode would have sort of a different, uh, different uh, transfer function effectively. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think I got it. Uh, any other question from the audience uh, here? Wait. So you said that um, like small scales enter the horizon in uh, radiation domination and therefore baryons don't affect them as much. Yep. But then they continue to evolve mm -hmm. and then they become like evolving in matter domination until last scattering. Exactly, so yeah. why then, matter, uh, then uh, baryons don't affect? Yeah, so, so then it's just a matter of the, the fact that um, you sort of need to match onto a pure cosine oscillation, and the sort of matching ends up continuing the cosine oscillation, right? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's effectively, continu it, it, that sort of sets the initial conditions for the continued evolution during, um, during, during matter domination, and, and you continue to get a, good, a pure cosine to a pretty good approximation, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, uh, let's uh, thank again for the lecture.